Hey everybody, welcome to week seven of the term. It's getting really close to the end in my estimation. And I know I've said this many times, repetitive, that uh, the term is just gonna go quickly. And it definitely at this point, we're way on the downhill. I am on day 60 of the self-quarantine count-up. These even numbers seem meaningful in some way. Uh, multiples of 10 seem particularly telling. All right, so this, class and this entire week worth of instruction is about, and the next two weeks is actually all about money. Uh, and obviously money is an extremely important commodity resource in a campaign. And today's class is going to be how to raise a campaign war chest. And that's maybe a little dramatic, the term war chest, though uh, that is a term that's frequently used. So it's not as though um, I'm kind of being over the top with, with the way I talk about it, but just how to raise money for a campaign. Uh, there are, as you see, I have all the notes on the board today, and so I'm going to just move through it. This is pretty, I've pretty commonly done this uh, in this class. But uh, one thing I'm going to note and not really dwell on too much is there, there are really two kinds of money for a campaign, uh, though they're all, it's still just money, and that's startup versus ongoing. Uh, there really are two distinct phases of a campaign fundraising operation, even though they're, they're not necessarily distinct in the sense that like this one's done and now we move into the other one, but they have distinct purposes and they do occur on a different timeline. And, and uh, there are different, really different opportunities. These are the opportunities for raising money. There are different opportunities available uh, that are most likely to raise you money in, in these two different phases. Startup money is the, is the money that you need to have a viable campaign operation. I mean, it's possible in theory, to start up a campaign on zero money at all. Uh, that you can have volunteers who will do the important jobs. You might even have a campaign manager who's a volunteer, um, who, who you know is able to say, well, I, I'll work for free for you for the experience and also I believe in you. But at the very least, the startup money is to get you the bare bone basics of what you need. And the bare bone basics of what you need for a successful campaign are a campaign manager. Um, and generally also then the campaign infrastructure, even just the most basic campaign infrastructure, you don't necessarily need a headquarters. You can run a campaign out of your house, out of your garage, out of, out of your office, um, or the, out of the campaign manager's uh, um, whatever kind of facility they have. But you do need the ability to make phone calls, you need uh, to be able to uh, have email and have a website, and a website costs a little bit of money, especially if you want, I mean, not especially, you want a custom uh, uh, domain name so that your communications can easily point you to a thing, uh, to, to, to people to the place where they have to go, and it should be a simple URL. So at the very minimum, that's what you uh, need. So startup costs don't have to be great. Um, there's another, aspect to startup costs, uh, I shouldn't say startup costs, startup, startup fundraising, and that is demonstrating the viability of your campaign. Um, in, in a perfect world, your campaign's viability is based on your candidate or your ballot measure, right? Is it, does it seem like it's going to be something that's going to be compelling for people to vote for this person or for this measure? That, you know, in theory, should be the viability threshold. In reality, there is a financial threshold to your candidates or ballot measures viability as well. Part of it is that you need money to be able to do the basic startup things. If you're talking about a ballot measure, you know, at the very least, if you want to be successful, if you don't want to just do a ballot measure just to see what that's like and have that experience, which there's a reason to do that actually, but uh, it's, it can be a kind of a waste if you're not actually aiming towards success. Uh, you, at the very least, you need lawyers to be able to write and assess uh, and go through the early processes of putting this with, with the uh, Secretary of State. You need people who are going to be able to uh, be the prof do the professional work to have a ballot measure even written that is, that is viable. Uh, now, these early startup things don't necessarily cost a lot of money, right? It doesn't cost a whole lot of money to get a custom domain and get web hosting. It, you know, it, it costs a, a decent amount of money, uh, though not a tremendous amount of money, to get a professional campaign manager and to get the kind of basic office infrastructure uh, that you might need, even though the office infrastructure might only be a URL, an email, uh, and some phones. Um, not necessarily a physical headquarters. But what's more important is that you're going to need ongoing funds. There's no doubt that at some point, 
in your campaign, it's going to be beneficial to be able to do polling or focus groups. It's going to be beneficial to be able to uh, do some kind of uh, advertising, whether it's traditional radio, uh, print, or television advertising, or whether it's social media advertising, uh, that costs money. You're going to want, at very minimum, to be able to print up campaign literature uh, and lawn signs, uh, depending on what, at, at, really at any level, uh, lawn signs are going to be necessary. And from the smallest city council race through president, lawn signs are a thing. You want to be able to, you have, you have to be able to print up campaign literature, and uh, printing is actually relatively expensive, uh, especially when you're talking about lower down ballot races. It can be the biggest part of your expense. So you're going to have ongoing expenses, and part of what the startup fundraising does is it demonstrates to potential funders that you have a viable campaign, right? Um, people are going to be more likely to give you money if you've already raised money. It, you know, and in, in the uh, broader capitalist economy, this is true too, it takes money to make money. Uh, it's, you can start up an enterprise on sweat equity and other people who are willing to put in sweat equity, particularly if they're young and, and don't mind scrambling. Uh, but even for the most sweat equity driven uh, startup enterprise, you still need to have money to produce something that you're producing. You can't produce it all on sweat. We're not plants. We can't take sunlight and air and rain and turn it into food. Um, <clears throat> we have to take resources and turn them into food services uh, campaign operations. So the startup is partly to generate the startup costs, uh, startup ex to pay for startup expenses, but it's, it's really a lot about viability. Now, where does the fundraising process start? Uh, I don't have a timeline here or any kind of diagram because it really, there, there really is not a straightforward process, though there are aspects of it where, okay, here's one thing and here's the next thing and here's the next thing in terms of what you're capable of doing. Uh, but where does the money come from? Here are the two big categories and then the third off to the side category. Direct contributions. Money comes from people and organizations to your campaign bank account. And events where, well, it does, the money does go to your bank account. Um, it also, it actually comes instead of from people saying, oh, hey, I'm going to contribute to your campaign. It comes from, oh, I'm going to go to this event or I'm going to pay for this event or I'm going to go to this event. And part of what then may happen is uh, a direct contribution may result from this. So distinguishing these two things is like, you know, in, in the world, there, th th there's a big overlap. You're going to get individual contributions from house party meet and greets or from uh, picnics and, and from uh, rallies. Uh, now a fundraiser itself is an event where people pay to go to that event. So a fundraiser is a form of event that generates money on its own, not from direct contributions. Though of course, fundraising tickets are people uh, giving, buying that particular ticket. Uh, they're not buying that ticket because they're interested in the dinner that you're going to serve or the speaker that you're going to have or, or whatever kind of you know, party-like atmosphere you're going to create for people. That's just the side benefit. That's just kind of the excuse. Um, <clears throat> so a fundraiser is also a form of direct contribution, but I, I think it's useful to think of these two categories separately because they are different ways of imagining how money can come in to your campaign. They're connected, but they're, 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 they're different. And they take a different level of, uh, or I shouldn't say level, they take a different style of organization to pull off. What it takes to, to organize and pull off a fundraiser is different than what it takes to organize and pull off online fundraising. Um, now, I mentioned outside money. This is not, uh, and I put this in a box, this is not part of your campaign war chest, technically, because what outside money is, is it's not money from organizations. I'll talk about that. Outside money is money that is outside of your campaign that is spent on behalf of or to benefit your campaign. Um, and uh, this, could, this happens in a variety of ways, uh, and it's, it really, it's more of an issue at the higher level races. Presidential, Senate, Congress, or House of Representatives, Governor, uh, even Secretary of State, uh, you know, state, big statewide races, you know, a district attorney, um, things like Metro County, uh, uh, Metro uh, Council President, Races that have a lot of voters that uh, are and are you know carry with them a lot of importance. So people outside groups will want to spend money influencing voters' choices in those. There's also outside money that spent that is similar to what organization comes from organizations. Except uh, like for example, parties will you know the Democratic Party will essentially advertise so that people will think vote Democratic. And if you're a Democratic candidate, that's outside money. Um, I bracket this off because 
you don't get to raise money for outside money. You don't have to. And also campaign finance law prohibits coordination between the campaign itself, your organization, and outside spending being done on your behalf. As soon as outside spending is coordinated with a campaign, it's actually considered by campaign finance law to be a campaign uh, expenditure and therefore it uh, um, rules of donation limits and spending uh, limits kick in and disclosure requirements, they all kick in. So outside groups, I've sort of boxed it. They bracket themselves that they actually have to be separate uh, from campaigns. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more next time. I'm gonna talk about kind of managing the money of a campaign. But one of the things I will note is that I'm gonna do the campaign by that staff before I then move down this uh, list. I just wanna take a tour of the board here. One of the things that is important in a campaign uh, is lawyers, or you know, I put lawyer, you don't need multiple lawyers, though it, depending on the scale of your campaign, you may want multiple lawyers. But one of the people on your campaign finance staff is a campaign finance attorney, somebody who specializes, or at least one of their specializations is campaign finance law, because all aspects of campaigns are regulated by state and uh, federal statutes, um, but uh, the most highly regulated area is campaign finance. There, were, you know, there are some rules for what you can spend, uh, for what you can do in terms of activities, uh, but almost all the rules are about raising money and spending money and disclosing the, the raising and the spending of money. So the, the, those three main categories, and the rules are complex. Uh, and they uh, vary from state to state. There are some national standards and they vary from state to state as well. Uh, and the different, even within a state, the different types of races have different uh, types of rules. If you're running for city council in a city, you might have different campaign finance rules than if you're running for state legislature. If you're running for uh, a judicial position, you have different campaign finance rules than if you're running for uh, a legislative position. So I can't tell you in this lecture what the campaign finance rules are. This, I'm, I'm gonna include zero of that in this class. There's gonna be no instruction either in the readings or in the lectures on campaign finance regulations. Because one, it's a huge area. And two, I'm not an expert. Uh, and three, you're not an expert either and you don't need to be. But what you need is you need to be able to be connected with a lawyer. And this is one of the other startup costs and also potentially an ongoing cost, but really it's a startup cost because what you want is you want the uh, finance operation of your campaign to be put together initially in a way that complies with the law and that the people who are involved, the treasurer and the budget manager, that these people know what the rules and requirements are. Um, now, they may know it already, right? You may be able to, to find a treasurer who's an experienced campaign treasurer who has done this several times and therefore knows the rules. Um, and in which case, uh, you don't necessarily need to hire a lawyer to uh, make sure they know what they're doing, though it's always good to have a consultant. Now, the lawyer doesn't have to be part of the staff, the ongoing staff. The lawyer can really just be uh, a, um, a sort of uh, outside pro, a paid professional, a consultant who does all kinds of other work but is an expert in this field. But also, you, it's part of the startup because you want the, both of these people, as well as your candidate probably, uh, and uh, your campaign manager, if they you know, d don't have a lot of experience, to be instructed in what is required. And it's the restrictions on what, how you can raise money are really less relevant than the disclosure requirements and the paperwork that's required. Uh, and what the deadlines are for filing uh, your various kinds of financial uh, disclosures and then what those disclosures actually are. It's a relatively bureaucratic uh, process and like any bureaucracy, it helps to have an expert who knows how to navigate that bureaucracy. It is truly, as bureaucracy is for most enterprises, it is truly one of the annoying things about running a campaign. It doesn't contribute at all to uh, getting the votes that you need to win the election, but it contributes to staying on the right side of the law and it contributes to your ability to not be attacked by your opponents for flaunting campaign finance law or for you know, being a rogue operation. You also need a treasurer to manage the inflow and outflow of money and then the budget manager, and I'll talk about the budget manager next time. And these, these titles, you know, various campaign organizations have different titles for these particular roles. These are just kind of generic titles. The treasurer is the person really responsible for raising the money and getting the money. And then the budget manager is the person uh, responsible for 
spending the money and and deciding what what expenditures are worth the you know the the limited resources that every campaign is always going to have. And again, next week is the class where I'll talk really about what the budget manager and in, in, in combination with the campaign manager, how they make these decisions as to what is uh, done. These two people though interact, as I uh, talked about when I laid out early in the course the, the sort of overall connections of people on the campaign, they interact because the budget manager s says to the treasurer, okay, we're, we're falling short on, um, uh, on money to do television ads and we need more money. So you need to go out and raise more money. You need, you need to step up or the treasurer is able to say, you know, uh, hey, uh, I need more resources to run campaign events so that we can raise more money. I need money to raise money, uh, and you're not giving me enough money to be able to raise the um, extra amount of money that I'll be able to give back to you. So there's an interaction here. These two people might actually be the same. These two roles might actually be fulfilled by the same person. Um, and in fact, in a very shoestring campaign, the campaign manager might be wearing both of these particular hats. Okay, so so much for that sidebar over there. I want to get back over to how it is that you raise money. Um, the startup money that your campaign gets is traditionally going to come from individual contributions. Um, and there's a kind of a conventional wisdom in party politics, particularly party politics, I should say, that if you yourself can't raise on your own, with no other assistance from uh, anyone but your own contact list and your personal connections, family, friends, coworkers, people in co community organizations that you work with, uh, that your own money, that if you can't raise a certain threshold of money as your startup, then no one else is going to be interested in helping you out. And this is particularly true in, in party politics where it's like, okay, it, you know, it, the, here, here's one piece of conventional wisdom. If you're running for the U.S. House of Representatives uh, and you want to run under the banner of the Democratic or the Republican Party, the party leaders at the, at the county and state level are going to want to see you able to raise $50,000 without any help from anybody but your network of individual donors. To, first of all, to give you that, that startup money, that seed money, um, and to get, get you a running start, uh, but also to show that, yes, you have what it takes to raise the roughly, on average, million dollars that it will take to run for and win a seat in the House of Representatives. And if we're talking about a challenge to an incumbent, uh, and if we're talking, or if we're talking about a, an open seat with, with lots of people running both in the primary, uh, and then you're going to have to do a primary election within your party, and then a general election uh, against, uh, for, a, for a swing seat against uh, the, an opponent from the other party, we're talking about more than the average amount of uh, money for it. The, the million dollars is the average across all 435 races. And that's just kind of a typical ballpark. So the conventionalism is you have to be able to raise $50,000 or more to be able to even demonstrate that the party should even be interested in you at all. Um, and this, parties are a little bit more, I would say, you know, uptight about this, and, but it also demonstrates to organizations, I've listed parties as one of the organizations, to interest groups and political action committees that, okay, here's a, here is, in fact, a candidate. Let's, I'm going to focus mostly on candidate uh, elections uh, today, as I have mostly throughout this class, with sort of noting ballot measures on the side. Uh, but here's a candidate who is a person who has enough connections and enough, uh, say, um, of a compelling profile that people, individual people, are going to be willing to essentially give up their money to that candidate. Uh, individual in, uh, donations, particularly at the beginning of a campaign, are very much about faith and trust. Uh, at a certain point in a campaign, and this can be pretty early on, uh, and it's definitely true for an incumbent running for re-election, Campaign donations can, are, can be seen as an investment, right? If you're an interest group and uh, you have, uh, and there's, there's a, an incumbent who is running for re-election and that person's uh, policies align with the policies of your interest group and that person is gaining seniority and, and at some point, maybe even this next cycle, going to be the chair of a, of a powerful committee in the area of policy that your interest group is concerned with, donating money to that candidate is an investment, not the investment in the sense of like you're buying their vote. It's an investment in making sure that somebody who sees the policy area from your perspective 
uh, is in a position of uh, power to do something about it, right? Um, and that's why incumbents generally have an advantage over challengers because one, they're known quantities, but also when you're investing in a policy outcome, you're, it's a long-term investment. If I get elected to the Oregon State Legislature this year, uh, I'm not going to have much influence. Let's say I get elected to, even to the Senate, right? There are only 30 senators in the state of Washington. I'm one of 30 senators. I have 1 30th of the votes, and really I have 1 15th of what it takes to pass a, a bill with a majority. So that's a decent percentage, but I'm not even going to get to choose what committees I'm on. And I'm certainly not going to be a committee chair. I'm not going to be an influential legislator. If I win two or three more, if I win one or two more terms, I could get there, especially if I'm a person who's, who's good at cultivating those uh, um, re uh, relationships that I'm going to make as soon as I land in Salem. Uh, but if I've won once or even uh, twice, especially, I'm a good investment in terms of seniority, in terms of also a known quantity. I'm a person who has a, who has a record. So uh, interest groups particularly are going to be in, in, uh, investment-oriented contributors. Parties absolutely uh, are investment-oriented contributors because they are investing in their majority and, that's, and they want to invest their scarce resources in people who, one, are uh, likely to win, they don't want to throw away money, uh, and two, are going to be pretty loyal to the party agenda. Um, so uh, <clears throat> this is organizations that are looking towards uh, investment style. Individuals, when you ask, you know, if I, if I decide that I'm going to run for Oregon Senate, um, I find out that Lou Frederick is uh, retiring, he's my current senator, I find out that he's retiring, and I uh, realize, I'm like, oh, hey, there's, this, is, this is a winnable dis Senate seat for me, and I know all about campaigning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. How am I going to start? Well, I'm going to reach out to all the people that I know who know me and who would be likely to say, oh, yeah, I could see you in the, I could see you in the state Senate. Sure. Uh, they're investing in me as person. They're essentially not even investing. They're just saying, okay, I, I have faith in you. I also believe that you would be good in this position. So when you pick up the phone to write, to call those individuals, and this is really where, and the term, you'll hear this in the uh, guest lecture for this week from Tom Hughes, the term dialing for dollars. Um, dialing for dollars is, you know, you, there, there are lots of methods that don't involve actually picking up a phone. And of course, there are no dials anymore. You just hit the contact. Uh, but dialing for dollars is not the, what happens throughout the entirety of campaign uh, fundraising, but initially it absolutely is, and it continues to be something that you have to do throughout the campaign. Um, one of the things you'll hear in, in uh, Tom Hughes' interview is how much of his day when he was running for Metro president he spent in some kind of direct outreach to potential donors to his, to his campaign. Uh, but... Individuals are people who really you're just asking them to have uh, faith and trust in you. And so what's needed there is a, is a personal appeal, is a pitch. You're not going to generate very much money if your contact list is not very big. And this is one of the things that uh, you know, is often recommended to people who are thinking about running in, at some point in their life is what you need to do while you're not running yet is you need to build up your network of potential supporters in the future. Now, part of what that means is building up um, t ties with organizations, building up ties with parties, right? Like having, if, especially if you're running for a partisan office, like Senate, um, where there's going to be a primary, and Lou Fredericks has a pretty safe Democratic seat. So if he, re if he retired, uh, the Democratic primary uh, for that seat would be the election. Because once, once you win the Democratic primary, there's not a Republican challenger in North and Northeast Portland who's going to take your Senate seat. Unless somehow you're just this horribly scandal-ridden person who somehow managed to win the primary. But even still, you're probably not even going to get a Republican challenger. Uh, but So the, the, the uh, cultivating relationships in the party so that when I'm running in the party primary, I'm actually known by people in the Democratic Party in Multnomah County, uh, and particularly in my community, so that it's not so suddenly like, well, who is this guy? You know, Because if I right now decided that I was going to run, let's say that Lou Frederick were in fact retiring, and I were running for the, uh, for the primary right now, which is uh, a week uh, and a day away, 
uh, I, I would like people would be like, who is this guy? It would be really hard for me to have any kind of realistic expectation of winning that primary if I just come out of nowhere. So part of what we're what you're doing pre candidacy is cultivating those uh, relationships, but also cultivating even just having a bigger contact list. Um, I looked at my phone prior to doing this uh, particular lecture just to see, speculatively, how many names of people in my contact list I could actually call up if I had the guts to do it. And this is part of what it's, it's, it, it's really hard. Like this takes just a tremendous amount of guts to you know, call up your father-in-law, to call up uh, a, a coworker of yours, to call up a close friend. Uh, you know, like I think about my, uh, some of my close friends, uh, couple friends that you know, my kids are growing up together, they, I met them in preschool. To call any of them up and say, hey, I'm running for state senate and I'm getting my campaign going, um, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to raise some money to hire a campaign manager, um, can, you know, can, you, can you donate? And you donate fifty dollars, or I mean, to ask for fifty or hundred dollars takes a lot of quick spot. Even just it kind of makes me my chest clench even thinking about that possibility. But I looked at my phone and I was like, okay, let's say I had the uh, that I had the, the desire and I had the courage to do this. And I was like, okay, here's what my pitch is, and here's why it is I'm doing this, and I'm actually a viable candidate. I'm not asking people to throw away money on this totally harebrained idea. Um, how many people actually could I call? In my case. I looked at my phone, and I have a decent number of contacts in there, but many of them are just business things, and also people who, you know, like, if I organized a carpool uh, with, you know, uh, my daughter's friend in second grade, and I still have their parents' phone number, uh, and it's not a person who I could be like, hey, remember that carpool I organized when my daughter was in, our daughters were in second grade? Uh, <clears throat> while I have a decent number of contacts, and it actually made me think, I'm like, boy, you really need to clean out your contacts, Jack. Uh, you need to really, because it's just, it's too many. I only had at most a couple of dozen people that I could pick up the phone and call. Um, if I got a 50% hit rate and each of those people gave me $100, I would raise $1,200, which is not nothing. It really is not nothing. And for if I were running for state senate and I actually had also uh, connections with parties and if, if, if I knew people in interest groups that could potentially later on endorse me and or loan me money, that's, that's, that's a decent amount of money, but getting a, that, that's actually a totally fantastical estimate, right? Uh, 50% hit rate with a $100 donation from each person. I, I can't imagine. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that my mother would donate $100. I'm pretty sure that uh, my um, in-laws would donate $100 and, you know, I, who knows, really. But now, here's one other thing to note. One of the things that needs to be known, like, can my mother even donate money? To my political campaign. This is what the lawyers me will tell me because the answer to that question is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, there are restrictions in uh, states and in local elections on getting contributions from people outside of the geographic district that you will be representing. Um, and so, and I don't know what those rules are, right? So already, if I were going to do this, if I were going to call up my mother and say, hey, can you donate $100 to my campaign? Um, I mean, really, what I could have her do if I wanted to kind of get in that gray area, if there is a restriction, I could just say, hey, you know, um, will you send me $100? And by the way, I'll donate that money. Uh, I'll, I'll use my own money to finance my campaign because you can self-finance. And she, So she could send me a $100 check for my birthday or something, or Father's Day. Well, I, I don't air quote birthday and Father's Day. But um, she could send me a check and I could then have that money in my bank account and spend it on myself. Because self-financing is, of course... Uh, an important thing. One of the most important individuals is yourself. Um, but again, how much money do you want to, of your own money do you want to invest in a campaign? Like, do you want to spend five thousand dollars of your own money getting a, a, an office that pays very little money? Like, you know, it's it, it, do you invest in yourself that way? Yeah. You're again, if if you don't believe in yourself enough to donate money to your own campaign, then probably you're not going to be able to make that case to other people. But initially, individuals are going to come from your circle and you're gonna have far lower than a 50% hit rate, and you're going to not get $100 from each person. And you don't necessarily need it. Like, one of the things to, to say is like, hey, anything from $10 up to is, 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 is helpful. Um, part of what you have to be able to do as a candidate is be able to, as I say, have the courage and the fortitude, and then also the pitch. What are you gonna to say to those individuals? Now, 
Bundlers are essentially people who will do this on your behalf. They will call up their contacts. They will call, they will talk to people that they know either in their inner circle or one layer out, or they will then uh, call up their, 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 their inner circle and the bigger inner circle is personally the better. And then the, if you have half a dozen people who are like, Hey, I believe in your campaign. I'm going to reach out to my people on your behalf. Um, Often bundlers are uh, actually officially organized as a campaign committee, as the people who are um, specifically legally you know, organized to raise money on behalf of this campaign. Uh, bundlers can also be an unofficial, like basically what they do is they say, hey, they reach out to people and say, hey, will you send a $100 check or a, in case of a federal election, a $3,000 check to this, here's the address to this campaign. So bundlers are people who, who network on your behalf. So bundlers are getting individuals from their own circle. The individuals that you're getting as direct contributions are from your own circle. And then these two things work together where there's, you know, ideally there's a network effect where uh, as the connections become uh, richer and more people are, are enrolled. So like my initial circle of donors comes from my contact, comes from my phone. Uh, those people could be enrolled on my behalf to raise more money. You know, like in, in a case where I'm allowed to raise money from all over the country for whatever office I'm running for, I call up my in-laws who have a bunch of friends who have money, who are, uh, have themselves been active in politics. My father-in-law actually himself was a county commissioner in Ohio in uh, the early 90s. So he knows people who have been involved and he himself has raised money. So he could, if he believes in me, he could call his network of friends and I could, I could actually then sort of make him a bundler or just have him spread the word and have those people contact me directly. Or he could give me those numbers and I could say, hey, I got your number from John Emerson, uh, who, you know, is a friend of yours. He's my father-in-law and I'm running for Senate in Oregon. I know you live in Ohio, but here's why I believe that blah, 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 right? <clears throat> so our individual contributions can, they start with our inner circle but then they can, they can move out of the sphere. So part of having a viable candidacy, even before you become a candidate, is having a contact list that contains enough people that you can make that first pitch. Now, bundlers are very important, and really with ongoing campaign uh, financing, bundlers are gonna be really uh, helpful because essentially what you're doing you know, the, the treasurer will be the person who's getting the checks from the bundlers, either from the bundlers themselves or directly from the people that the bundlers suggest. And, you know, it used to be that it literally was like people would give a check to the bundler and they would put it and they would cover it with a rubber band and they would, they would bring it over to the campaign treasurer who would then talk, walk, you know, sign all the stuff and walk into the bank. Uh, now with uh, e-commerce and electric, uh, electronic banking, it's way more just things, m money gets moved around. Uh, but uh, the nice thing about bundlers is they're, you're essentially outsourcing a decent chunk of your campaign finance operation so that you don't have to manage these people. You just have to set them free. You have to give them the information about where, where to send the checks. You have to give them some talking points uh, so that they you know, are likely to be uh, effective and so that they're also not misrepresenting your campaign to the people who are donating money because you definitely don't want to be doing that. Uh, but then it's off to the side and it's, just, it, it, it's, it's happening on its own in a way that will be a revenue stream, an ongoing revenue stream for your campaign. Uh, and as you as your campaign progresses and as you get more attention, the job of the bundlers becomes easier, right? As you are noted by the world around, as, as people see your name in the newspaper or they see an event or they get, a, you know, they're, ideally they're also now getting enlisted onto the campaign uh, email. Um, so they get uh, a campaign email list, so they get an email saying, oh, there's gonna, I'm going to be giving a speech at Alberta Park on Sunday at 2 o'clock. And they don't necessarily go. They're like, oh, here's a guy out there running. Yeah. So there's, a, there's an outside momentum. And it's really beneficial to be able to create a, this kind of organic momentum. Now, this is not outside group money, right? This is not outside money where they're going to raise it and spend it on uh, your behalf without camp coordinating with the campaign. This is actually campaign donations. And so they, they, they have to meet... Um, both uh, um, donation limits and uh, disclosure uh, requirements. So this is, this is still all part of like, there's, there has to be bookkeeping and there has to be record keeping and there has to be disclosures. Um, online fundraising is, you know, now it's, it's a real thing now and uh, it is really just a way of reaching individuals without 
doing the literal dialing for dollars aspect. What you're doing is you're communicating with potential donors via social media platforms. Uh, and primarily in local elections, Facebook, but also there are ways to use things like GoFundMe uh, and uh, Kickstarter to, uh, to raise money for campaigns. This is where the lawyer can get into uh, to be helpful as, as to which of these platforms can legitimately be used for political fundraising and also which platforms themselves do and don't accept uh, um, political fundraising pitches. But there are definitely opportunities. And then just online, like your website, which has a donate button on it somewhere. And part of the, part of the reason why you have, need startup money is you want to have a website. You want to have a good web developer, at least, you know, not necessarily dedicated to your campaign, but to be able to pay somebody whose job is to develop web pages for all kinds of uh, organizations to be able to then put that button there and that button goes to a place where the person can donate money and it goes right into your bank account and then of course the record keeping for disclosure uh, is, is automatic. Uh, online money rate, uh, fundraising allows also, this is where you leverage the small dollar donors um, and a big part of modern campaigning all the way up to the presidential level is crowdsourcing a campaign. Right? And some, some candidates have the ability to do this more than others because of their nature. For example, Bernie Sanders uh, and Barack Obama were both just like you know, small donor machines because their personality and their message lends them well to the small dollar donor. And they're also, uh, they have the, uh, the, the staff to be able to leverage a bunch of five and $10 donations into millions and millions of dollars. Right? It actually takes, right, it takes more than just the appeal uh, of the candidate, it actually takes uh, the campaign organization. It takes somebody who knows how to crowdsource uh, a small dollar donations. Uh, there's also in online, there's the possibility of the direct appeal, and this is where the communication operation, of course, overlaps with this. You know, you, you put together a, a, and most online um, platforms that allow crowdsourcing to raise money for their platform, uh, they give you instruction like, okay, you should have a video pitch. Uh, you should also have maybe some swag, like, okay, if you donate $100 to my campaign, you'll get a campaign t-shirt. So, uh, but you want to, like, if you want to create a, ca a campaign appeal YouTube video uh, or a short video for either IGTV or just an actual Instagram post, a Facebook video, um, this is what you can do online, allows you to put your candidate into a lot of people's faces, in a good way, not like in your face, but into, in front of people's eyeballs and in their ears, uh, in a way that doesn't diminish their calendar time out there doing things, right? Part of, part of getting individual donations and then even organizational donations, and I'll talk about this in just a second, is that it's time consuming. It's, it is, in this case, the literal dialing for dollars. Online fundraising allows you to uh, not necessarily get bigger donations and not necessarily even to get m more of them than through dialing for dollars, but just to do it at a low cost in terms of the time resources of the candidate. You can make a YouTube video appeal, you can have it, you can craft it, it can be workshop with the campaign manager and the speechwriter uh, and uh, um, the candidate themselves and they can work on it and it can be edited and then it's done. However much time you put in to that appeal, um, maybe you'll want to do a second one or a third one uh, as the campaign moves on and you're trying to raise more money in an ongoing way or messaging changes or events come up where you want to show uh, your candidate actually speaking to the things that are happening uh, in the news. Uh, but you can, you can invest a very little amount of time and almost no resources into an appeal that then frees up your candidate to do other things. Organizational money is really for ongoing fundraising. Uh, oh, right, online can actually also be used as a startup. Uh, you know, you can, you can actually, and this is where, if you have some kind of uh, social media platform, if you already have a blog, or you have a pretty big uh, Instagram or Twitter following, or you have a pretty good Facebook presence, either individually or organizationally, um, you can actually, uh, now it's possible to not have to do the individual thing where you, where you pick up your phone with your contacts and, and reach out to those people. You actually, you have contacts, you have what's called in the online world platform to launch something from where you can get your startup money raised. You can raise $10,000 for your campaign, which for some campaigns might be almost all the money you need even for your ongoing operations with uh, an online uh, um, push early on and you can get, if people already knew who, know who you are, they already connect with you and 
they have the ability to just donate ten dollars very easily right imagine if you have uh, ten thousand Twitter followers because you are an opinion leader in some in some kind of way and you put out an appeal to uh, say I'm running for this office and you uh, here's a link to my website which has the video appeal on it and donate five dollars that's all I'm asking I'm not don't even ask for a hundred dollars just ask for five dollars because people will give more if you ask for five dollars um, <clears throat> but and some people will just give five dollars you could very if you have uh, ten thousand Twitter followers you could raise ten thousand dollars very quickly not every one of those people is going to give a dollar but you can there are certain kind of uh, um, approaches that will allow you to leverage that. Now, 10,000 Twitter followers is a lot. Uh, and if you don't have that, and all you really have is you don't have much platform, you don't have a Facebook presence, you don't have a bunch of Instagram or, or Twitter followers, you do have to then rely on the more traditional individual. But online donations have more and more come to supplant the need to be able to s sit down with your phone and dial for dollars to your connections and then get bundlers to do the same thing for their connections. Organizations are really going to be the fuel for most campaigns in an ongoing way. They're not gonna be the startup money. Uh, and so a big part of the startup operation is to demonstrate the viability to these organizations. But they can actually be and will be a, a substantial portion depending on how much money you need to raise for whatever office you're running for. They can be a substantial portion of the final uh, overall total and of the ongoing money that is given. Interest groups are particularly uh, um, useful for a candidate because your candidate and or your ballot measure uh, has a policy appeal to particular kinds of groups. And interest groups want policy victories. That's what they're organized to do, is to get policy victories. And so they're going to invest in people who are going to get them closer to those policy victories. And investing for them means, not bribing, it means spending money to help favorable legislators uh, and executive positions get elected. And that's, ex that's just democracy from the point of view of interest groups. One of the reasons why they raise money from their members is so that they can invest in elected officials to get their policies uh, across the finish line. Um, it can sound very corrupt, especially when the interest groups are large-scale corporations or uh, industries like the pharmaceutical industry. It tri this, the, the, talking about interest groups automatically triggers a lot of people's th uh, feelings about special interests uh, and uh, you know money just winning. And while that does happen, what really a, a pluralistic democracy like ours is, it's a, it's a competition of interest groups. And what those interest groups are doing is there's a multiplicity of things that they're doing to try to get their interests advanced. One of them is they invest in campaigns and, and they have money specifically for this. Political action committees are very much like interest groups in that they are specifically organized often by interest groups or by corporations or by unions or by a community organization to specifically raise money to, for donation uh, to political campaigns and political action committees are basically just a little more formalized version and there's a legal status and a tax status uh, and there's disclosure requirements and this is what your campaign finance lawyer I should probably uh, aim in the future to get a campaign finance lawyer to do a guest lecture for this class uh, and I shouldn't probably I should definitely do that I haven't done that for this course and, I'm, and I'm, I apologize for the, for that lack of uh, connection on my part uh, but political action committees have different rules, but also they are more directly oriented towards raising money from their members or from the world at large and spending money specifically to get candidates elected. And parties, of course, parties do a lot of things, but definitely one of the things that parties are doing is raising money for the party so that the party can then get money out to its candidates. Uh, now, if you're, if, if you're running for a safe seat and the primary is essentially the election, the party's not going to be a major source of your funding. It, it's when you win the primary uh, and you go to the general election that parties are going to be a much more uh, important source of your financing to run in the general election. So if you're uh, running for a nonpartisan election um, or if you're running f in, in a safe seat where, like if I were running for Lou Frederick's Senate seat, if he were retiring, I would be running against a bunch of other Democrats. And the Democratic Party isn't necessarily, isn't going to give money to me as opposed to other candidates. They're going to essentially stay neutral on it um, and just know that, well, we're going to get a Democrat. Now, they're not going to be fully neutral in the sense that if my ideas align with the Democratic Party leadership's ideas and other people running for the Democratic nomination are either too moderate or too, uh, too liberal com compared to what, say, the Multnomah County Democrats want, they're going to help me in ways that 
probably aren't financial, that are probably more organizational. Um, so it's, it's not as though we're going to get a financial advantage from parties at the, at the primary level. Um, how do you get money from organizations? Well, it's a very different process than getting money from individuals, though it's the same kind of uh, communication goal. The communication goal is to say to somebody, invest in my campaign because I'm the right guy for this position. Uh, I'm the right person for this position, in my case, guy. Uh, <clears throat> I'm the right person for this position. With organizations, with interest groups, that pitch is going to be targeted to what their organization is, as opposed to with individual voters um, and what bundlers are going to do. And even with the online appeal, you're really going to be appealing more broadly based on your character, your experience, and the broad range of your issues and, and what you're going to bring, why it is that you are a, uh, your candidate is a good fit for this job. Interest groups are going to care more about, are you a good fit for our policy? And are you going to be the person who's going to get stuff done, right? Um, if there are two Democrats running in a primary election that's essentially the election, let's say that there is me and someone else running for uh, Lou Frederick's seat, um, they're going to look at both of us and be like, okay, one of you is going to be in that seat. Which one of you is going to be more likely to uh, help our policy priorities get advanced? Um, this is where your appeal is going to be very much about, your candidate's appeal is going to be very much about like, okay, not only do I believe in the stuff you believe in, but here's why I'm actually going to be successful at helping achieve, because I care about them. Um, so the, the, this form of fundraising really connects really strongly with the communication stuff that I talked about in the previous couple of weeks, where you really want to have a candidate well prepared to go and talk to these organizations um, and go to their events. If they have endorsement uh, interviews, go to those. If they have meet uh, candidate forums, you definitely want to know about those and go to those if they have the opportunity for you to go speak to an event they're holding, like a luncheon for their membership, you know, back when events are allowable again. You want to know about those and you want to essentially invite yourself or have your, you know, you invite uh, your candidate, it gets invited through the campaign that says, hey, let's let our candidate come speak to this. Uh, that is a really uh, important way of raising money and this is the most sustainable way and it also, it, one, one of the things it does is it, one, it keeps your candidate from having to sit at the phone all day and dial individuals. Um, but two, it su serves a dual purpose of not only getting your candidate out there raising money, spending whatever number of hours it takes to raise, in this case, usually will be thousands of dollars instead of, say, 10 or $20 at a time. Uh, you know, if you're on the phone for two hours, talking, dialing up and calling people, you can, I mean, maybe you're going to raise a few hundred dollars, uh, even if you're, you know, unless we're talking about a Senate race, but... You're going to raise a few hundred dollars. You could, in the same two hours, get a $3,000 uh, um, donation from an interest group. And <clears throat> you're reaching voters at the same time. So organizational fundraising serves a dual purpose. Now, individual does as well, because presumably you're getting votes, unless, of course, it's people outside your district. Like, my mom can't vote for me. My father-in-law and mother-in-law can't vote for me because they don't live in my, in my district. They can give me money. Often, you're not raising votes at the same time you're raising money. Here, you're raising votes too. Often also, and I've mentioned this before, and this is an imp important thing to, to emphasize, you could enlist them as an outside group that will go to work for your campaign too, right? They will actually include you in their campaign literature. They'll include you in their newsletter uh, endorsements. They'll include you in their messaging that you don't coordinate with them at all. Um, and uh, that is obviously beneficial. So this allows you to reach donors and voters at the same time. Now, what about events? Now events are, as I indicated at the beginning, events are oriented towards the same thing. They're oriented towards people giving you checks um, or transferring money into your, into your bank account. Uh, all three also serve the same purpose, dual purpose, as getting organizational donations, which is they also get your candidate out there reaching voters. Um, and meet and greets, in fact, uh, actually, meet and greets and rallies are directly uh, um, oriented towards generating supporters as much as generating donors, um, but they serve the dual purpose. And I'll, I'll, I'll go down to rallies first. You hold a campaign rally, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, give a speech, 
at Alberta Park at two o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We're gonna come out there, we're gonna set up banners, I'm gonna set up speakers. Of course, I've gotten the permit to do this from the, from the park. I'm holding a campaign rally. Uh, my, uh, I've sent out the messaging to my email list. All this stuff is happening. This is, a, this is an attempt to excite people, to win voters, to get my candidate out there giving a speech and showing the, uh, the energy and enthusiasm that will drive voter support. On election day um, and you know election day is as it's Monday today right now election day is a week from tomorrow and people are casting their ballots because in Oregon we have mail-in people are doing their ballots right now if I had if, if, if this kind of thing had been possible in the world that we live in which it isn't currently but my candidate would have had a rally yesterday on Sunday on Mother's Day a Mother's Day rally right um, at a rally your primary purpose is to generate excitement, to uh, get people to vote for you, to, to generate name recognition, to get media attention, right? If, you know, if you hold a big enough rally, uh, you know, the Waterfront Park Mother's Day rally for Jack Miller for U.S. Congress. Um, <clears throat> I know I'm switching around what I'm running for, but I, I think you can keep with me here. And one of the television stations sends uh, a truck to film it, and they put a two or three minute segment on the nightly news. That's that's generating support, that's generating name recognition, that's generating uh, potentially votes that are going to help me win this election. A rally is also a time when you want to make available donation opportunities to people. Um, so you have, like, it's not exactly the um, church passing of the hat, but it's not exactly not that either. Um, so there, there is a financial appeal that you can make in a rally. Now, there's an art to this where you don't want to make it seem like the rally is essentially about raising money because that can backfire, that can seem icky. And what you're trying to do here mostly is generate voter support and name recognition and excitement. You can generate some financial uh, support as well. Meet and greets are more specifically designed to generate money and secondarily generate an opportunity to, uh, for people to um, get excited about your candidate and for you to get name recognition. Um, and the two kind of most common forms of meet and greets are house parties and picnics. And they're, they're really, they're kind of the same thing, except the house party is like at someone's house, uh, or it could be at somebody's business. It could be a, a house party that's actually like somebody owns, let's say somebody has an art gallery and they want to support your candidacy. They don't want to donate a bunch of money themselves, but they want to support your candidacy. You know, you're a community activist in their, in their neighborhood and they're like, oh, hey, you know, I have an art gallery on Alberta Street that's in the district uh, of the Senate seat you're running for. I, I have an art gallery and so I can't give you any money because I don't have any money because I'm an art gallery. Um, but what I will do is I will have a, a, a house party. It will be a house party in terms of technical terms, but I'll have a gallery party where um, you can send out the word, I'll send, I'll, but I'll mostly send out the word. Like house parties are organized by the holder of the party. Um, they say I'll send out a notice through my email list and through my social media channels to people and say, hey, we're having a, a, a meet and greet. Jack Miller, running for state senate for this district, will be at our gallery on Monday from 6 to 9 o'clock meeting uh, voters. Come out and uh, see what this candidate's all about. And what is going on at a house party is for sure traditional vote and support and energy generating campaigning, but it is also explicitly uh, aimed at getting checks from people who are there or um, getting people to say, okay, I'll think about donating. And of course, you could get a check from them right there. You could get a cash. You have, should have the, avail the ability to, to uh, at least one campaign worker who's able to do collect money in that way. Also, then you want to have campaign literature that shows your URL, where the donate button is going to be. Whatever methods that you're using to actually channel cash into the treasury, you want to make available. But this is, you're, for a house party, you're outsourcing, much like with bundlers, you're outsourcing to people who are supportive of your campaign the um, activity and energy and resources and hassle of organizing an event. Um, a, a picnic, and it doesn't actually have to literally be a picnic, though a, 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 a picnic is in fact a great American tradition of campaigning since the mid 19th century. Uh, and because our elections are in the fall, picnics happen in the summer and the early fall, picnics are actually, literally picnics are a great thing. There's food, there's, uh, kids can run around, it's outside, it creates a lot of good feeling. It, it, it provides people with an event, which hopefully they have fun at, and then they also get to meet the candidate. 
I'm Jack Miller, running for state senate. You get to meet me, and people, you know, what, they come to this and like, oh yeah, you know, I, I've never even met a state senator, and here's a guy running for state senator. This a picnic is organized by the campaign specifically, um, unless it's a picnic version of a house party. House party, right? It could be a picnic house party. So house party is just a technical term for somebody else organizes it. And uh, for any of you who've had parties or run events or done, you know, set up even you know a, a, a half a day conference for your work or for an organization that you work for, you realize there's a lot of resources and energy and project management that goes into holding even the simplest of events. Um, house parties are where you essentially outsource the project management and the resources that go into creating the event. A picnic is where your campaign actually does it. The same thing happens at both of them. The candidate is there and the purpose of the candidate's presence is to meet people and to expose themselves to the eyes and ears uh, and hearts of potential supporters and voters and also to generate uh, excitement in them to help um, to get them to decide that, oh, okay, I'll donate $100 to your campaign. Uh, many local elections are financed, if not exclusively, primarily through house parties. Um, if you're running for city council in Gresham, in Vancouver, um, in Lake Oswego, uh, if you're running for mayor of Hillsborough or Gresham or uh, I don't know, I'm running out of time, Milwaukee. You can raise the money that you need to finance your campaign largely by having a dozen or so supporters who themselves will organize house parties to bring in people either that they know or that, they, that people that they know know, right? Like, okay, I'll invite, my, uh, I'll invite my boss to a house party because, I mean, maybe a lot of people don't have that relationship with their boss, but many people will. So meet and greets are a great way of dual purposing, just like uh, when you pitch to interest groups, when you go to an endorsement interview, or when you go speak to their membership, or when you go to a candidate forum that they have organized. They're great ways, and the nice thing is, in a campaign, part of raising a campaign war chest is that, and I mentioned this earlier in terms of the interplay between the budget manager and the treasurer, and I mentioned this back when I was talking about the overall organization of the campaign. Raising money takes resources. The ideal, is to expend as little resource as possible and generate the highest return for that. Organizations with their events and house parties with uh, uh, um, essentially outsourcing are going to be ways in which you can raise money and support, voter support, on the cheap in terms of you don't have to spend a lot of your campaign staff's time organizing them. You don't have to spend money renting something, right? If you're gonna have a rally, uh, you may need to rent a place. If nothing else, you need to get a permit typically, and that often costs money. If you're going to hold a fundraiser, and fundraiser is the final one I'm going to talk about, a fundraiser is what we're most uh, familiar with. I think the, the common political culture is most familiar with the way, this way of raising money. A fundraiser is a banquet that people pay, they buy a ticket, and the price of the ticket is high, way higher than the cost of what it goes in to put on the event, and so there's essentially a profit for the campaign. So it's a, you know, it, it, the ticket costs a thousand dollars and what it costs per person that's going to show up is uh, $50, right? $50 in terms of their, their share of the rental and the chairs and the food and the alcohol and the servers. A fundraiser, it's a very high profile way of raising money. Um, and it can, depending on uh, the kind of people that you can invite and the price point at which you can pitch it, uh, is going to be a potentially very lucrative style of fundraising. But it's also resource intensive in terms of organizing. And there's an investment involved. You have to um, rent a, a, an event space. And usually the event spaces are going to want that money up front. Um, and you're going to have to rent chairs and a sound system and you're going to have to buy food and hire a caterer. All of that stuff, all of those are uh, costs to the campaign. So you already have to have money to be able to run a fundraiser. Now, hopefully, and the ideal is that you get way more in return than you spend on it, um, but it is a risk, and also how big of a return is it, right? If you spend uh, $5,000 running and creating an event, event space rental, chairs, sound system, food, alcohol, servers, all that stuff, um, and you get $10,000 from that, you've raised $5,000 net for your campaign. 
but how much time and what level of resources and what level of risk, because it might have been that you ended up only raising $7,000, um, uh, so that you, your, your net was two. It's a very, it's, it's, it's an energy and resource intense kind of endeavor, and it may not necessarily be the best use of the resources that went into it to make that $5,000. Um, but it is, it is potentially a lucrative thing. There's also fundraisers, even much more so than meet and greets and rallies, which are very candidate centric. These are very candidate centric. One of the r ways to raise money from people who are potentially supporters of yours, but really they just have money, is to provide uh, an exogenous reason outside of your campaign to get people to buy a ticket. And this is one of the places where, again, connections are really key. Um, if, for example, um, if I'm running for state senate and uh, Barbara Roberts, who was the first female governor of Oregon um, and still a very prominent public figure and well-known, if I can get Barbara Roberts to agree to speak at my fundraiser, not only does that, she doesn't even have to officially endorse me, though presumably if she's going to give a speech at my uh, fundraiser, she's probably also going to give me her endorsement. Um, but maybe she won't, right? Maybe I'm running in a Democratic primary and um, she doesn't want to take a stand on, on which Democratic candidate uh, is, is the one that's better, so she's not going to officially endorse me, but if, but if I, she knows me personally, I don't actually know Barbara Roberts personally, I know somebody who knows her personally, so hopefully I could get this to happen, but if Barbara Roberts will come to my fundraising event and I can therefore charge a $200 ticket to people to attend, and a decent number of those people are going to come because they're like, well, you know what, I would love to see Barbara Roberts speak, and, uh, you know, it's, it's only 200 bucks. I have 200 bucks to, you know, it's a Saturday night. Uh, to, I would spend 200 bucks on a Saturday night anyway, so why not see Barbara Roberts? Um, it would be awesome, for example, if I could have somebody like Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama. Obviously, that's shooting for the stars. But at any level of which you could generate, or let's, let's say, for example, that um, I know uh, a member of a high-profile band in town, which I actually do know some people who are in bands, and those people would be willing to play for free or for some extremely cut-rate amount at my fundraiser, Again, people will come and go, oh, wow, I could, I could actually see in a crowd of 100 people, I could see the Decemberists reunited. Uh, you know, I'll pay $200 for that. Right? Obviously, tons of people, that's just way outside their price point. But you don't need everybody to be able to come to your fundraiser. You only have a certain number of seats anyway. Uh, so fundraising is, can be a way that people can support, that you can enlist support for your campaign um, one, from people who don't themselves donate to you, right? Like if I got the Decembers to reunite and play a fundraiser for me for my state Senate bid uh, and charge $200 a ticket for this fundraiser and what you got for $200 was you got dinner and a couple of drink tickets and you got to see the Decembers play a 45 minute uh, show. People, the Decembers, they themselves can materially support my campaign without giving me any money. Uh, um, they're, you know, they're, they're supporting me. Um, they're also... Um, generating people who are going to bring money to my campaign who don't necessarily support me, or it's not, hopefully people aren't going to come who are actually opposed to me, you're like, well, you know, uh, I'm going to go see the Decembers, but I hate you and I'm voting for your opponent. Um, but it gives me a chance to raise money outside of the sphere of people who are excited by my campaign. So there's a, there's a value add that you can uh, generate uh, with a fundraiser. That said, all of that said, those, that's an exciting possibility, right? To raise money from Decemberist fans uh, based on the fact that I just know a person in the Decemberist and they are like, oh, hell, sure, why not? I, we're not doing anything and we'll, we'll get back together and we'll, we'll set aside all the animosity that broke us up in the first place to play this one show and we won't expect you to pay us and, uh, you know, a $200 ticket sounds fine to us in terms of, you know, we don't feel like we're sellouts or anything. People, I will now generate money outside of the uh, political support that I have. That's exciting, but also it takes a lot of work. It takes that connection. It also takes the willingness of, for example, the Decemberists or Barbara Roberts to come to your fundraiser, and that is to get that to happen is not necessarily easy. But if you have that ability, and if you have those connections, uh, fu fundraisers are a way to essentially raise money that you wouldn't have been able to raise otherwise, right? These, the people who pay for that ticket 
aren't necessarily the pe people who, if you weren't having that fundraiser, would go to your website and click the donate button and donate $200. Um, they, they may be people who wouldn't even donate $10. They're only there for the attraction. Um, or there's people who are like, hey, you know, I, I'm not a December's fan, but that'd be fun to see them, and I'm for this guy, and you know, I'll pay $200. Uh, I would, you know, if I went to a fancy dinner with my uh, family, I would be spending $150 anyway, so why not spend that same amount of money or just slightly more to help this guy who's running for Senate? You can raise money from people who aren't necessarily as excited directly by your candidacy as the people who are, who are gonna donate this way, and from people who aren't necessarily investing in you in the same way that organizations are going to be investing in you, um, because they're like, oh, you're a good, we want you in that seat to, to win, to advance our policy. You could generate money from people who are, you know, have money and they will spend their money in this particular way. Um, again, it takes a lot of organization. It takes campaign resources. It actually takes money to make money in this particular way. And so it may or may not be worthwhile to spend the however many labor hours it takes to put together this $200 a ticket Decemberists fundraiser rally uh, fundraiser uh, event to you know rent the sound system all that stuff all right so one of the things that you can see I hope you can see is that there are opportunities to raise money and there are challenges to uh, to getting people to give you their hard-earned cash in any of these uh, particular ways like I mean particularly here one of the challenges is identifying the interest groups convincing them that you're the right person or your candidate is the right person to forward their uh, policy objectives uh, there are uh, certainly challenges, but there are opportunities. Um, you can also see that what there is is there are trade-offs, always, because raising money is, uh, it will eat resources. And one of the biggest things that you're doing, and I'll talk about this next week, this is the topic of next week's uh, um, uh, lesson, is how to balance those different competing needs of a campaign, how to make those decisions, how to evaluate the trade-offs, how to decide whether or not it's useful and beneficial for the campaign as a whole to spend however many labor hours putting together that $200 a ticket December's fundraiser that ends up raising a net of $6,000 for my campaign. Is that $6,000 gonna be what I need to you know, buy the radio ads that are gonna take me across the finish line? Um, and th therefore, yes, it's gonna be the right choice for the campaign at this particular moment. Even though it's gonna eat up all this time of my volunteers, it's gonna take a lot of organization. We're gonna actually have to spend money in order to raise this money, and that's a risk. What if we don't sell all the tickets uh, and we end up only making $100 uh, net out of this whole thing and we waste all this time? Those choices, the sort of big picture of uh, what it means to run a campaign in terms of uh, financial resources and all the other resources and the balancing, uh, balancing the competing demands of a campaign, that's gonna be the topic of next time. And that kind of brings us back to, the, back to the beginning of what does a campaign organization look like? Because a campaign's goal is to win the election, not to raise the most money, right? Uh, the campaign's goal is to win the election. And so these are the opportunities and the challenges for raising money. The question of, okay, how does this fit into the overall machinery of a campaign and money can be it can be very compelling it can be very much like we're gonna raise a lot of money raise money raise money we're raising money that's what this campaign is about and you raise a ton of money and you neglect the other activities which will which are necessary for winning because uh, the more you focus on raising a campaign war chest the less time and resources you have to do other things which are also necessary um, money is not a metric for victory the only metric for victory is votes money can be a means to getting the most votes, but it has to be seen only as a means. How to balance, that's gonna be the topic for next week. Until then, from day 60 of self-quarantine count-up, uh, I'm your professor, Jeff Miller.